This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Presence. Thank God, thank God. And uh, isn't it a joy to know that there's no place that you can go in the world where anybody can manufacture His presence. We cannot manufacture on earth what only comes from heaven. And that is the uniqueness of God. Whenever something is holy, say holy. holy. Holy means that it is set apart. God sets a distinction between everything that comes from the kingdom of God out of heaven. It is holy, set apart. Holy, holy. God is holy. He has no peers. He is holy, and we reverence Him and honor Him as such. And we thank God for the power of His incredible presence that transforms us, that what is there comes down and touches us in an incredible, fantastic way. Well, if you would open your Bibles, Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. Beginning with the very first verse, there you'll notice these words, Joshua chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Now it came to pass that when Adon Ezedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they all they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and, and all its men were mighty. Therefore Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoam, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, uh, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Deborah, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. And therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibeon and made war against them. I want to talk about conquering challenging relationships. Conquering challenging relationships. It is clear that there are some people that you meet in this world that will challenge your very soul. Everybody has that somebody that just knows how to push your buttons. You know who they are. I hope that you don't live with them. <laughs> but every now and then there are people that will vex you. They aggravate you. They frustrate you. And how do you deal with that? Here Joshua is leading the children of Israel. They had already seen God do incredible exploits, conquering various places where they had been. And these folks had heard of how God was with Joshua. They heard about how Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came a-tumbling down. They had heard about that. And uh, they heard how uh, Joshua had defeated the little city of Ai. And now they had heard that Joshua was in Gibeon. And now they are so intimidated that these kings, one king went to four other kings and said, listen, you guys are my friend. He went, they went to their allies and now an alliance of five nations, five different kings band themselves together to fight against Gibeon, Joshua, and the children of Israel. This is the hostile environment that Joshua now finds himself in. Isn't it amazing that when you are a friend of God, that sometimes you become an enemy to the world? Well, uh, it's enough to fight one enemy. It's enough to fight one enemy. But when you've got five people 
that gang up on you, five kings ganging up on you. Now that should have been called bullying. That, that, that was bullying in, 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 its, in, in its full right. See, that's a different story when five kings, and this is what Joshua uh, was dealing with, five different uh, enemies, bullies coming against him. And, and, and I want you to be determined to fight for what you believe and what you want. Be determined to fight for what you believe and for what you want. And uh, because everything in life that's worth having, you're going to have to put a little fight to get it. And not only do you have to fight to get it, oftentimes you have to fight to keep it. Don't ever be at ease to say that what God has done, that you don't ever have to fight to keep that thing sharp. No, you have to, if you had to fight to get it, you're going to have to fight to keep it. Sometimes you have to fight to get saved and then you have to fight to stay saved. Uh, so, uh, when most people's destiny is being fought, it is oftentimes fought by relationships primarily. When that destiny is being fought, it's being fought by a, a relationship. Some two-legged human being, some group of folks that's working against you. It's not some spirit and some idol someplace, you know, sitting in a statue or something. It's a two-legged human being that's working against your destiny. When the devil really wants to derail you, he will partner you up with false friends. He'll send you a wrong spouse into your life. I don't know anything that derails destiny faster than marrying the wrong person. That's why that decision is so critical. It is so critical. He uses relationships. He uses relationships. You have to be very careful. Anybody who's close enough to help you is also close enough to hurt you. And so uh, this is why it, it, is, it is the betrayal of friends that, that hurts you. In fact, you have to be in a trusted relationship to even betray somebody. It's impossible for an enemy to betray you because you don't trust them. The, pre, the, the relationships that really damage you are the ones that you have trusted with the intimacies of your life. You've trusted them with your friendship, with your inner thoughts, with your fears. You've trusted them and then somebody betrays your trust. And so the, the, the wounds or the betrayal of our friends is much more severe than the wounds of our enemies. The betrayals of our friends is much worse to us than the wounds that come from an enemy. But the point of the matter is, is that we're in a fight. I mean, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 reminds us of that. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. When you have faith, you're going to have to be in a fight. You need faith for this fight, that there's a victory. Whenever you, you, you hear the word victory, it means it's as a fight. You're going to go through a struggle. You're going to deal with opposition. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be surprised by it. Brace yourself for it. Train yourself for it. If you know you got a fight coming up, you better train for it. Wouldn't it be crazy to have the fight of your life uh, in preparation for you, and then you put no time preparing yourself for that fight? And the Bible has already told us, 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He's saying you need to fight. You need to fight. It's a fight to get to the faith and it's a fight to stay in the faith. But there is a fight. And no matter how many changes uh, people may take you through, you have to be determined in your heart and determined in your mind that you are going to grow through them, grow through them, and don't let them change the essence of your God identity that he has given to you. Don't let what you go through change who God called you to be. Don't let what you go through change the essence of the God identity. Don't go through hard circumstances and allow hard circumstances to make you bitter. Because God didn't call you to be a bitter person. He didn't call you to be a mean-spirited person. He didn't call you to be an unforgiving person. Don't let what you go through make you into something that God never intended you to be. And so here, these, these are... These are Five kings who have allied themselves, they have allied themselves against uh, Joshua and the children of Israel, fighting in Gibeon to try to wipe all of them out. And Joshua had to conquer 
these five kings because that was a promised land and they hadn't gotten to it yet. And you know you got to fight on your way to try to get to where God has prophetically declared that you're supposed to be. Now, I know some people think that because somebody prophesies that, that something is going wonderful is going to happen to you that you don't have to do anything. No, no, no. No, no, no. You have to fight to get into that prophetic promised land. And every time that there's a prophetic promise, there's always a problem in front of the promise. Always a problem in front of the promise. You cannot lose your faith, but you've got to fight so you can get to that place of victory that God is calling us. He's calling us to victory. And uh, so uh, there are kings that are in your life, and, and these are relationships. These are relationships that must be conquered before you can enter the promised land. And see, if you don't deal with these things before you get into your promised land, you get in your promised land, and these things that you never dealt with before you got to the promised land will, will ruin your promised land experience. So there are relationships that you have to deal with before God can bring us into our promised land. And sometimes we're wondering, God, what's taking so long? Maybe he's waiting on us to deal with some of these kings, these things that are ruling in some areas of your life. There were five of them. There were five. How many were there? There were five of them, five of them. And for practically everything that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. For practically everything that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. The devil is not a creator. He's a counterfeiter. He takes things that God has created and he perverts them. The devil is a counterfeiter. He's a counterfeiter. And that's how he makes his, his living. And see, these five kings, five kings ruling, uh, they, are, they are a counterfeit fivefold ministry. They're a counterfeit fivefold ministry. Uh, you see, uh, the core of the ministry here was Aaron and his four sons, fivefold. Here's the five. They were the core. They gave all of the other instructions to all of the other Levites. They came from Aaron and his four sons. They were a type of the Old Testament of the fivefold ministry. They're a type of the fivefold ministry. So we have to uh, clearly be able to get that. But, but these five kings, these were allies that were sent to destroy them so that they could not enter into what God had already prepared for them. Uh, some of you may realize or remember this in Scripture, but after David killed Goliath, after David kills Goliath, David spent the next 40 years killing Goliath's four brothers. He spent the next four years. And see, when you take down one giant, he's got some relatives. And, and you think that because one person dies that all of your troubles are over. Think again. Think again. Think again. I'm just telling you. So uh, you, you might have to fight some enemies. And David had... He killed Goliath, but there were four brothers that Goliath had. And, and for the next 40 years, took David 40 years to, to tackle all of Goliath's other brothers. And so uh, it's interesting that in, in another sense of the word, these five kings that allied themselves against Joshua and the people of God, sometimes these are, are you can look at these five kings as your five keen senses of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. These can be five kings. There are some people that are totally ruled by their flesh. It rules them. And your five senses are sometimes the five kings that are working against you because you are so ruled by your feelings that you can't follow God. See, here's what I want you to see, is that every decision that you make, hear this carefully, every decision that you make is, is made either by your body, your mind, or your spirit. Every decision that you make is made either by your body, your mind, or your spirit. Um, feeling is the voice of the body. Feeling is the voice of the body. Feeling, it is the voice of the body. So when your body talks to you, it's like, I, I, well, it's, it, it feels like such and such to me. I don't feel like I should do that. I don't feel like God wants. 
feeling is the voice of the body. When a man touches a woman in a certain way, ooh, feeling. Your body starts talking to you because feeling is the voice of the body. Reasoning is the voice of the mind. The mind reasons. Every decision that you make, every decision that you make either comes from your body, your mind, or your spirit. Every, every decision that you make. Feeling, though, is the voice of the body. Reasoning is the voice of the mind. And then uh, discernment is the voice of the spirit. It is your conscience. You discern certain things in your spirit. I mean, you can meet people that's connected to your children or somebody else that you know and love. And uh, you don't know anything about them from a conscious level. You've never seen them do this. You've never heard about this. But in your spirit, anybody know what I'm talking about? You discern. You, you, you're a discerner. You're a discerner. See, every decision that you make, you either make from your body, your mind, or your spirit. Your body, your mind, or your spirit. Your feelings, or your reasonings, or your discernment. And there are just some decisions that I, I, I couldn't go by my feelings. I didn't go by my reasonings because I had a discernment in my spirit that I trusted over my reasoning. Because, you know, when you uh, sometimes are just looking at things through reasoning and you said, you know what? Look, oh, they look so good on paper. Oh, my goodness. Can you see this? Oh, guess where they work? Oh, look at this background. Look at the education here. And your reasoning can say, ooh, girl, ooh, girl, this man makes some, he, got, he makes a good salary. But sometime in your spirit, your spirit can say, you know what? He may make a good salary and come home and go upside your head. <laughs> you know, and, and, and then uh, you, 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 you may be able to look and say, oh, my God, oh, boy, my, my, she's stacked. She's so fine. But then she may be lazy. Then she may be disloyal. She may be untrustworthy. See, there can be some, she, she may have so much junk in her trunk. I'm, I mean, you know, stuff from her past that has not been, <laughs> that has not been resolved. What, what, <laughs> where is your mind? But ask yourself, ask yourself which realm is being used when I make decisions. Ask yourself which realm is being used when I make decisions. Am I making these decisions from my body, my mind, or my spirit? My body, my mind, or my spirit. Listen, whenever you get married, you, listen, you need to go for number three. Go for your spirit to be able to discern something in your spirit. If you're going to go into partnership in a business, don't go by their resume. Go by your spirit because you can discern things. Your spirit knows things that your head will never understand. But every decision that you make either comes from your body. Your body. Oh, girl, I just like the way he make me feel. You get in a deep relationship, he's going to make you feel some other kind of way. <laughs> you have to go by the discernment in your spirit. But every decision, just think about that. Every decision that you make either comes from your body, your mind, or your spirit. Your body, your mind, or your spirit. I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 through 10, notice this. Now these things were our examples to the extent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as, some of, uh, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, there are five principal sins that kept the children of Israel out of the promised land. There are five, five principal sins. Five, how many were there? There were five that kept them out. Uh, how many kings came against Joshua and the children of Israel? Five. There were five of them. Uh, how many senses do we have? Five. You see, all of these things are, are, are speaking to us. There's a, there's a common thread here that's running here through the scriptures. But five sins kept the ones from entering the promised land. Uh, the only ones who entered were Joshua and Caleb. 
uh, from the original group that came out and all of the others could not enter in because of these five sins. These five sins. What were they? Lust. Notice this. Lust. Idolatry. Idolatry. Fornication. Tempting Christ. And murmuring, which is complaining. Tempting Christ is asking Jesus Christ to do something that is inconsistent with his character. It's asking God for something that's out of line with his word that is incongruent with his spirit. That's to tempt Christ. If you ask Jesus Christ to bless mess, see that would send the wrong message to you that it's okay. But these five sins kept the children of Israel out of the promised land. Lust, lust. Lust. Our society now thrives on lust. Lust, idolatry, idolatry, putting things in the wrong place, giving too much priority to certain things in your life, inordinate affection, idolatry, fornication, sex outside of the blessing of the covenant of marriage, fornication, fornication. Did I mention fornication? <laughs> in an, and it kept them out. Do you remember? They were in the wilderness and uh, these folks had a party. They had a party. And there was so much intercourse going on that God says, this is too much flesh for me. And he struck 23,000 of them dead just like that. 23,000 died in one day. 23. Now, these are the children of Israel. These are God's people. Listen, flesh is flesh. It doesn't matter whether you're Jewish flesh, Chinese flesh, white flesh, black flesh, African flesh, Hispanic flesh. Flesh is flesh. It's flesh. It's all flesh. At the end of the day, it's, you have to flesh it out. <laughs> it's all flesh. And so they, they were dealing with it. And these five things, these five enemies, still warring, still taking people down today. Lust. Lust for money. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eye. The pride of life. Lust. All that is in the world. Lust. Lusting after stuff. Idolatry. Fornication. Tempting Christ. Asking him to do something that's incongruent with his nature, his word. And murmuring. Complaining. Can you imagine... Who wants to take complaining people on a trip? How do you feel when you bless somebody and then they complain? You didn't have to give them that. You didn't have to do this. Isn't it amazing that somebody said, you know what, she, she gave me this, uh, this old coat here. You didn't have one. <laughs> and they have the unmitigated gall to start murmuring, complaining over what you bless them with. And God says, if you're going to complain, I fed you. You didn't have anything to eat. You brought nothing to the picnic and you want to criticize me for bringing manna and I fed you and I rained down quail and then you got sick of that and you, saw, and you, God says, okay, die here. <laughs> Murmuring kept them out, complaining. I, you know, we use the word complain. We use the word complain in this day and time. It's complain. It is complain. It's complain. Complain. And that's the thing that actually kept the children of Israel out. Tons of them were kept out. They died in the wilderness because they murmured. It wasn't fornication. It wasn't lust. It wasn't idolatry. It was complaining. Complaining. I wonder how many folks would be dead today if God was still struck. <laughs> but I tell you this, you know, isn't it something if, if people want you to be better to them than God was? God says, listen, I am not taking complainers with me to a, to a promised land. And you know, because I gave you a peanut butter sandwich and you complain because you didn't get any jelly? <laughs> when you don't have anything to eat, listen, when you are starving, peanut butter sandwich or peanut butter cracker, whatever, I mean, whatever, <laughs> sardines, it doesn't matter what it is. When you, you don't get choosy, when you don't have anything, you don't have the right to be choosy. You know, you go... <laughs> I mean, the right attitude when you don't have something and somebody blesses you with it is thank you. Thank you. You didn't have to give me this, but you did. Thank you. All they gave me was $2. You didn't have that. Thank you. And they didn't owe that to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And, and you know what? If you ever see somebody with a grateful heart, guess what? It opens up the door to make you want to bless them again. It really does. I'm telling you, Thanksgiving, having a heart of gratitude, it builds a bridge over which future blessings will be brought. But when somebody blesses you and you murmur or complain, you set fire to that bridge and burn it up and nothing else further can be brought over it. And so it, it reminds me, you know, as I mentioned, that these five kings are, uh, are, are it's, a, it's a counterfeit that the devil uses. You know, the authentic that he brings for the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and the teacher. The apostle governs. The prophet guides. The evangelist gathers. It's the longest finger. He goes farther than anyone else. He, he gathers. Uh, the the, uh, the ring finger, this is the pastor. The pastor guards the sheep. It's the good shepherd. And, and, and this pinky finger, this is the teacher. The reason that this one is the pinky is because this is the only one that is small enough to get in your ear. <laughs> this, is, this is a teacher. The teacher grounds. The apostle governs, the prophet guides, the evangelist gathers, the, the pastor uh, guards, and the teacher grounds. And this becomes the anthropomorphic hand of the Lord. Down in the lives of people, blessing us, preparing us, and equipping us to be who and what God has called us to be. This is the authentic thing, but in the Old Testament, these five kings that banded against them, these were like five fingers that banded together like a fist to try to knock them out of God's plan for where he wanted to bring them in. So we have to look at it in that way and then bring them into the place where God has, has designed for us to be. Now, I want you to notice this first king here is Adonizedek. Adonizedek means Lord of Justice. Lord of justice, Lord of justice. And what he's doing is not very just at all. He's ganging up with four other kings to try to defeat the people of God. That's not very just to me, Lord of justice, Adonai Zedek. Now remember, the scriptures teaches us in the New Testament, these things were written for our example. If it's written for our example, what is the example that we learn from Adonai Zedek today, Lord of justice? You know what it means? This Lord of justice here is where a person makes themselves Lord in their own minds and tries to justify themselves. He's the Lord of, of a, this is called self-justification. It is a king of self-justification. Always finding a way to excuse his or her behavior. It's the king of self-justification. Listen, you will never have peace until you effectively deal with Adonai Zedek in your life, the Lord of, of justification, self-justification. You will never have peace. And see, whenever you mess up, you're always trying to justify yourself. You're always trying to justify yourself. All of that mess of, of self-justification, Adonai Zedek, he really reared his head in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. They, they wouldn't accept responsibility for their sin. They started justifying themselves, started the blame game. They wouldn't accept it. And so they tried to justify themselves. The woman that you gave me. And then, no, no, no. It was a serpent. It was a serpent. And they started passing the book. After they sinned, they tried to justify themselves. And whenever you try to justify yourself, you make it where you cannot be justified by God. Because either you justify yourself or God justifies you. And so the false attempt to justify yourself makes it where you cannot be justified by God because you think that you don't need it anymore because you've justified yourself. This is Adonai Zedek who still rules in the world today because there are too many people that are never wrong. It's Adonai Zedek raising his head as an enemy uh, of the, the king of, of self-justification. And you will never change behavior that you're trying to justify. You will never change behavior that you're trying to justify. If a person keeps justifying their grades in school, if they keep justifying uh, their inaction, I, 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 I didn't get the bill paid because of this. I didn't do this because of that. If they keep justifying, it means that they're not going to change the behavior. You will never change behavior that you keep justifying. But if you're going to have peace in your mind, you have to have justification. And justification can come by only one means, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Justification can only be obtained by one means, that is, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you can get it. Jesus' blood justifies us. Jesus' blood justifies us. Jesus' blood justifies us. What does that mean? To have Jesus' blood to justify us means his blood makes it just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's why God can love us even when we do stupid things because the blood. Thank God for the blood. And the blood makes it where it's just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. If you're unfaithful, God, the blood has already covered it. The blood, the blood, thank God for the blood. It makes it just as if I'd never sinned. You wonder why he could still love us? It's because his blood has blotted it out. And it makes it just as if I'd never sinned. It doesn't just merely cover it up. It makes it just as if I'd never sinned. So to be justified means to be totally vindicated of this thing, cleared of it as though it never happened. It's, it's vindicated from your record. It's, it's a sponge from the record. It's just as if you had never done it. That's what real justification does. And it only comes by means of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful. Say it. Somebody ought to shout, thank God for the blood. But you see, we as humans, we deal with Adonizetic because Adonizetic always tries to, to, to get us to justify it. As human beings, we try to justify ourselves by number one, blame, blame. We try to justify ourselves by blame. Because in order to get blame off of you, you got to put it on somebody else. And so when God goes to Adam, he, the, the woman, he goes to the woman, the serpent. And they just pass, just throwing the thing. It's not me, it's, it's, it's this person. And that they keep passing it. So in order to get blame off of you, you have to displace it. You have to put it on someone else. But instead of Jesus putting blame on anybody, Jesus took the blame. He took it on. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That we through him might become the righteousness of God. But when we try to justify ourselves with the Adonizetic, we, with uh, the, the, the Lord of self-justification here, uh, we try we try to do it through blame. We blame other folks so that we can be justified. We, 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 you know, uh, you know it, it's just the system. It's the system. <laughs> you, you know, the, the demand is against me. You know, the man. <laughs> the, and they put blame on somebody else. They put blame on them. Blame. Blame on them. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, they lie. They lie. They, they just bold-faced lie. Now, it, it wasn't my fault. I, I've always been this way. And isn't it interesting how lying is almost innate in human beings? Even a toddler will lie to you. If you ask them if they did something wrong, they're like, no, I didn't do it. I, I, I didn't do it. You know, when my children were younger, you know, they, every now and then we'd come over and we'd find some artwork drawn on the wall with crayon or a pen or pencil or something, and they would have, somebody would have written on the wall. And we got all the children lined up there, and, 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 and nobody did it. <laughs> Somebody be standing there with the writing utensil in the back of the hand. <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's just, and they, no, but we didn't teach them that. I'm like, where, where did this come from? How many of you all have children? How many of you all have seen children manifest behavior in that, you, that you didn't teach them? <laughs> And, and, and if you do see it, you know it came from your spouse's side of the family. <laughs> so when we're trying to deal with Adonizetic, this... this uh, this king of self-justification, when we're trying to justify ourselves, we justify ourselves through blame. We, we justify ourselves through a lie. We justify ourselves through explaining, just trying to explain, explain. Uh, when I say explain, I mean rationalize it. Rationalize. So notice how you, when you slow it down, rational lies. <laughs> that's, that's all that it is. Uh, 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 when you go to explaining about the sin, well, you know, you're out playing ball and, and the, the, it came right to you. You know, the sun was in my eyes. 
It, it's in everybody's eyes. It's, it's a rational lie. A rational lie. It's just rational. Just trying to explain it. I mean, when, whenever you go to somebody, you're trying to, you want a, an account for something. You gave somebody some money or, you, you know, gave them a responsibility, a task to do, and they didn't get the job done. And, and when you hear them preface their remarks with these words, what had happened was. <laughs> it is a feeble attempt to try to explain something, you know. You know, with my daddy, we just, it was easy for us to just go ahead and do it than to try to explain it ourselves to him as to why we didn't get it done. So uh, they, they do it either you blame, they lie, they explain, they explain. Here's another one, they deny. They deny. Uh, to deny means to refuse to accept responsibility. The alcoholic who's an alcoholic and he's in denial over his alcoholism refuses to accept responsibility for his alcoholism. He refuses to accept responsibility. I'm not an alcoholic. I, I, could, I could quit whenever I want to. I mean, you know, if I really want to quit, you know, I mean, I can quit it. <laughs> He's in denial over his, over his problem. And folks that, that get sexual addiction, they're in denial. They'll have addictions and, and they're in denial over it. They refuse to accept responsibility. And here's the deal. You cannot change any behavior for which you will not accept responsibility. Here's a principle. I mean, this is, it's, it should flow in logic. If you don't own it, you can't disown it. And so it's just simply about owning it. It's about owning it. Now listen, God is God. Hebrews 13, 8 says he's a, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, does Jesus forgive today? Yes, he does forgive today. Uh, will he forgive tomorrow? Yeah. Then did he forgive yesterday? Yes, he did. So by the nature of God that never, ever changes, it never changes. God's nature never changes. Had Adam and Eve asked God for forgiveness and said, Father, we have sinned against you and against heaven, against your word of what you commanded us to do. We have sinned. By God's nature, he would have had to forgive them. But they wouldn't own it. They denied it. They, they shifted the blame. They, they refused to accept responsibility. No, 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 no. It was a woman. It was a woman that you gave me. She, she, was, she was eating here and she, she handed it to me. And it, God, you said the day that we ate that we'd surely die. She took a piece and she was still alive. <laughs> Adam never owned it. Adam never took responsibility of it. You can't get forgiven for something that you don't take responsibility of. Eve never took responsibility for it. It was a serpent. It, it, this, it slithered up here and he started talking to me. And it, he showed me some stuff. It was looking good. I was hungry. It was that time of the month. I was so hungry. <laughs> Eve refused to own it. She ate them out of a house and home. They had to be put out, not because... God's nature was not to forgive. It was his nature to forgive. He would have forgiven them had they owned it. Had they owned it, God would have had to forgive them and restore them. He would have forgiven them, but he couldn't accept, you know, you, you, you can't grant, uh, you know, forgiveness of sin that has not been confessed. Confession is necessary for salvation. It is necessary for salvation. We have to confess it in order to be forgiven. And then here's another attempt in order to justify. It is to compare. To compare. You know, and, and, and here's the way that Adani Zedek rises his head in comparison. Well, you know, at least I did this, but I ain't as bad as so-and-so. <laughs> they start comparing themselves with somebody else. Well, it, it, you know, at least they caught me with a woman and was with another man. <laughs> and they start comparing it that, that this is supposed to be, make it better. Because you're supposed to... They start comparing in order to justify themselves. You know what you... I mean, I, I only got $5,000. You know, these other people, do you know, they be stealing millions. And I, I just... <laughs> See, they're comparing themselves to someone who's worse than they are to make themselves look good. That's an attempt to 
justify yourself. The only thing that can justify us is the blood of Jesus Christ. But something in mankind, because we are guilty, uh, it, it, it makes us want to get this thing off of us to justify it because sin brings three things into the life. Sin brings guilt, fear, and hiding. Guilt, fear, and hiding. These three elements is what's, it's the result of sin. Sin brings guilt, fear, and hiding. So in order to get rid of the sin that helps us to get rid of the fear, that gets rid of the hiding, it is to bring it out into the open and to confess it, to own it so we can disown it. But you cannot disown something that you have never owned, never owned. And so people, they, they blame, they lie, they explain, they deny, they compare. And then number six, they do something good to make it better. You know, when a person has done something bad, then they want to do something good. They use the, the good thing to try to justify the bad behavior. They use it do something good to justify something bad. They know they've messed up, so now here they go to buy some flowers. <laughs> now they go and get a big ring. They know they've already messed up, so they go and do something. They go and do something good in order to justify something that is bad. They do something good. And all of this is an attempt for self-justification. But there can be no justification until first there is some blood. Something has to die. Something has to die. And that's why we discover, you know, that Adam and Eve, you remember when they sinned? You know what they did? And they had to be brilliant. I mean, here they are in the garden. The Bible says that they sowed fig leaves together. Where did they get the needle? Where did they get the thread? I am really impressed. But it says they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. They could have opened up a tailoring shop. But a fig leaf has no blood in it. So God says your attempt to cover yourself is inadequate. And he brought to them coats of animal skin meaning that an animal had to die. Its blood had to be shed. It was a type of Jesus being the sacrificial lamb whose blood he was slain from the foundation of the world. And so he, they, they, I would probably like to say that they probably were wearing lamb skin. Is a type of Jesus covering the sin. Of man, some blood had to, where there is no shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Something has to die in our society. The innocent suffer for the guilty. Isn't it amazing? It is amazing. It blows my mind in our society today when we lock up young men and young women, particularly our young men, lock them up and send them to prison and oftentimes it costing as much as $100,000 a year for their 24-hour protection and their food and their medical care and their dental care to be able to house them in prison and we could take a fraction of that and educate them and send them to college and they would... I mean, wouldn't that make more sense? But you see, when a person commits a crime and they go to prison, they're not paying their own costs for being in the prison. It comes to taxes of people who are outside the innocent people are having to pay for the guilty. And that's what Jesus did. An innocent one took on himself the, the, the blame and the penalty for the the guilty, the innocent. It takes innocence, a spotless, a blemish, uh, a, 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 an animal without blemish or defect uh, to be able to take away the sin. And that's who Jesus became for us because we have an incredible need to be justified so that we can rest at night. You don't have any peace unless you're justified and somehow told your mind, you know, yeah, yeah, I did the right thing. Yeah, they'll thank me for this later. They didn't understand why I had to put them out, but I had to just put them out. You... But I want you to, I want us to really just take a look at some modern day kings that really keep us out of the promised land of where we are. And the first one is wrong relationships. Wrong relationships. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. 
You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And what I'm referring to more specifically, I want you to get this very carefully, because we're talking about conquering uh, these, uh, these really, really uh, challenging relationships. And I, I want to identify this to you, because what I'm, what I'm referring to here is toxic relationships. Toxic relationships. And these are people, toxic relationships are people with these particular characteristics, the following characteristics. They are people with bad habits. And when you're looking at toxic relationships, these are people with bad habits. You have to be very careful about having friends in your life with bad habits because habits are contagious. You know, you, you'll find them in your children. If their friends have bad habits and your children hang around them, your children will come home with a bad habit. You know, if there's a, if there's a certain vernacular that is spoken by the, by the, as a bad habit of a friend, then your child comes home and uses a bad word. They come home and use bad language that you don't even use in your home, but they have picked up the bad habits of those associated with them. That's a toxic relationship. It's people with bad habits, bad habits, bad habits, bad habits. If all of your friends can't keep a spouse, it's a bad habit. If all of your friends are always broke, it's a bad, it's a bad habit. It's a bad habit. It's a toxic relationship. Here's another one. Those who are always experiencing some kind of turmoil. There are some people, every time you turn around, they got some turmoil, drama going on in their life. It's like drama is the number. It's like, what is it this way? Okay, hello. <laughs> I mean, when you see that number come up, I mean, you just, you, you, don't, you don't want to answer it because you know that it's some more turmoil and, and you don't even have the strength to listen to what has happened now. What has, let me, let me just tell you, girl, let me tell you what. People who are always experiencing some kind of turmoil. Here's another one. People who are negative, perpetually depressed, unhappy, or pessimistic. These are toxic relationships. People who are negative, perpetually depressed, unhappy, or pessimistic. These, these are negative, toxic relationships. Touch your neighbor and say, I know some of these people. I know them. I know them. <laughs> when I say toxic relationship, here's another one. People who are constantly dealing with crisis, putting out fires all the time. It's, it's something else. They're chasing another thing down, trying to put a fire out over here. As soon as they get this, here's another fire going on. And something is always going on, always going on. People who are perpetually fighting with someone. Always. Because, Gary, you know what this, you know what this husband had the nerve to come up and tell me. <laughs> They're always fighting with somebody. They move from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, they fight with somebody there. They move from one job to another job, it's the devil. It's always on the... <laughs> Have I ever taught you guys the Bob principle? That when Mary has a problem with Bob, and Joe has a problem with Bob, and David has a problem with Bob, Bob is the problem. Amen. I mean, if problems are following you every place you go, and you're the only common denominator... It's amazing. And, and here's another toxic relationship. People who gossip. People who gossip. Who gossip. And listen, you know you should never trust a gossip because anybody that will gossip to you will gossip. So why would you ever tell your business to somebody that you know that's telling you everybody else's business? But see, that's, and it's unproductive. It is unproductive. It's unproductive. For you to be hanging around folks that are just gossiping. Don't let your ears become a, a trash receptacle for somebody else's garbage of how they feel and what they heard and, and, and this and other. People who gossip. Here's another one. People who are dream killers. People who are dream killers. All of these are toxic relationships. People who are dream killers. People who lack enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. In theo means God within. It's a life. It is an energy that you get because God is really in your life. So be careful about people who lack enthusiasm about anything in life. You ought to have to be passionate about something. And here, here's another one. People with a victim mentality. People who constantly uh, have a victim mentality. Everywhere they go, it's always something. They're always a victim. They're always a victim. Saying, yep, you got me again. <laughs> you have to be careful about that, uh, that victim mentality. And then people who blame others for their problems. Because whoever you blame, you also empower. 
And when you blame other people, you strip away your power from being able to change the situation because you're saying it's their fault. And the reason that I can't get ahead is because of what they keep doing. So don't play the blame game because it strips you of your power. It strips you of your power. And I'm not saying that people don't have any culpability over certain things that they might do that work against you in a certain way. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, unaware of that. But what I'm saying is that we have to look at situations and circumstances and say, what can I do? How can I respond to this person? Because I know they don't want me to win. They don't want me to get the promotion. They don't want me to make the sale. They don't want me to close the deal. And, but how can you close that thing anyway? That's what you have to say, that I am not a victim. I'm a victor. He called me to triumph, to make me the head and not the tail, to be above only and not beneath. So despite how somebody else feels about you, you know, if they push you down, you know that there's something that's on the inside of you that's just coming back up to the top. I mean, cream always rises to the top. It always rises. It rises. And so they can kill you. They can push you down. And still I rise. Still I rise. And see, these toxic folks are in denial of reality. They're in denial of reality. They refuse to accept responsibility for the reality of their life. And if you refuse to accept the responsibility of it, you'll never be able to change it. That's why in AA meetings and Alcoholics Anonymous, they, they make a person own it. I am an alcoholic. Because if you don't realize that and own that, if you don't own it, you can't disown it. And then you don't know how to guard yourself to say, you know what? I can't trick myself into thinking because I've been on alcohol for so many years. I cannot think that I can just take a little sip here and then, uh, you know, I'll be okay. No, you, you have to close that door because if I open that door to take a sip, I'm going to get drunk. And you can't fool yourself. And you said, you know, that if, if it, it only takes one sip. It only takes a communion cup size to lead you back into that behavior all over again. That's all that it takes. Communication is the basis of relationship. It is. And so um, I would say this to you. Um, determine never to let someone else's behavior dictate your reality. Never let somebody else's behavior dictate your reality. Now, I do want to give you a balance to what I'm teaching. You know, I've, I've, I've encouraged people to avoid negative people and, and uh, you know, guard your inner circle and all of that. But never cut what you have the power to untie. Never cut what you have the power to untie. If you can untie it, try untying it first. The cutting is a last resort. But never cut what you have the power to untie. And remember that because communication is the basis of relationship, if, if you talk to a person... Uh, you have to open your mouth in order to communicate. Open your mouth and communicate. Do you know that uh, through your communication, you can, things that have, have been like set on fire, you know how the Bible says that the tongue is an unruly evil that's setting on the very fires of hell itself because people can use their tongue and create great fires. Do you know what? I just recently read this that two engineering students have discovered a way to use sound waves to extinguish fires. Are you listening? They have, two engineering students have discovered a way to use sound waves, sound waves to extinguish fires. Now we can pull that, that, that scientific information into our spiritual world and say that there's a sound. Your voice creates waves. Now, if they've learned in the natural how to use sound waves to extinguish a fire, we can always speak and put out some fires of some different things that are happening, set the record straight, make it, you know, and, and we can extinguish some fires because certain things go because people have heard this and they've heard that. And sometimes if you just set the record straight, when they hear it from the horse's mouth, a sound wave can come and can put the, extinguish the fire. Here's another way that the sound wave can extinguish the fire. I'm sorry. It was my fault. I won't let this happen again. You can, you, oh my God. When you, if when you start saying, how can I make this right with you? How can I fix this? You can let the right sound waves come out and you can put fires out. If I've offended you, you know, I'm so sorry. 
please charge it to my head and not to my heart. You can create a sound and put fires out in some delicate relationships. I know that I should have been better at this or I should not have done that. It was my fault. I accept the responsibility. Can we start over again? And you can put fires out by the right kind of sound waves coming out of your mouth. And you have to ask the Holy Spirit because he said, let your conversation be yay, yay, and nay, nay, because anything else that comes out can become evil. And so as a result of that, you have got to know when to speak and when to keep your mouth closed. Proverbs chapter uh, 21 and verse 23 says this, that whoever guards his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. I love the way that the Message Bible says it. It says, watch your words and hold your tongue and you'll save yourself a lot of grief. Then I love Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 4 in the Message Bible. It says, don't respond to the stupidity of a fool. You'll only look foolish yourself. Amen. And so, but there's a power that is in your mouth. There is a power that is in your mouth. I don't know, have you all ever noticed, um, uh, you know, a big pen? And, and how on the cap of the big pen, you know, the cap of the big pen, it has a hole in it. Most people have never noticed it has a hole in the top of it. And why? I mean, is it so that if the, if the pen leaks it, it can come down on your clothes? No. You know what the purpose of it is? Have you ever noticed how people, when they have a pen or the cap of a pen in their mouth, they chew on it? Well, a certain percentage of people end up swallowing the cap. The hole is in the top is so that if they swallow it, they will not suffocate. And there are certain things that we do to people that is hard to swallow, and we make no room for them not to suffocate. And we end up suffocating the relationship. You've got to always leave a hole. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean the, the, the ink pen start talking to me. <laughs> but that's the reason that there's a hole in the top of the cap of a big pen it's because people end up chewing on it and a certain percentage of people is, ooh, they just, whatever, and it goes down and they strangle to death. And so it's to keep them, if they swallow it, you can still breathe through that narrow hole that's in the top of the cap. So God always makes a way to escape. Always give people a way out. And so I just, I, I just love it. But here, part of the pain, part of the pain that comes from removing a negative person, a toxic person from your life, stems from the fact oftentimes that we really want to help that person. And let me say this to teach this with balance, because I don't want everybody to, to assume and say, well, you know what, well, Bishop, yeah, I can't deal with toxic people. You know, you got drama in your life. You, yeah, get away from me. You get away from me. Don't bring none of that over here. I believe in balance. So let, let me say this to you. See, sometimes if we'll let our minds run back, we might have been negative at one time. And we might have been pessimistic and depressed and unhappy and gossips and with a victim mentality. And all of these issues, and somebody, somebody had to be assigned to us who, who, who wouldn't give up on us. Somebody had to pray for us, and they had to put our, their arms around and say, baby, come on, baby, you can do better than that. That's not you. Somebody had to get in our ear and just keep on talking to us and keep encouraging us and keep praying for us. See, you've got to be sensitive enough and discerning enough in your spirit to know uh, that this is a toxic person here, and they're keeping me from my goals, from my dream, from my destiny that God has called me to do. But you've got to also realize that there are some toxic people that you're assigned to minister to and give grace. And you've got to realize that there are some people that keep messing up and they keep doing drama. And I mean, sometimes until the day they die, they will still have stuff going on. I've done the funerals of too many people, and they never got straightened out in their lifetime. But some of them. Even if it was nothing but a grandmother that said, come on, that's my baby there. That's my baby there. Everybody needs somebody in this world that thinks the world of you. 
that thinks the world of you, that even though that you've messed up and you've done stupid things over and over and over and over and over, and you said you weren't going to do it again, and then you do it again, you got to have somebody in your corner that you realize I'm assigned to this person. Yep, this is my fool. <laughs> this is the one, that one, that one right there. I can't give up on him. I, I got, still got to pick up that call. I still got to talk to him. I still got to loan him. I got to keep $20 because I know they're going to come back to me. I, I, I got, because I, I know they're coming. And, and, and you get angry, but, but you know, you have a grace. You have a grace. You have a grace. And, and there are some people that we are just duty bound to be able to minister to, to extend grace to. And when they do see the light, they are so thankful for that person that never gave up on them, that still believed in them, that still encouraged them. To be what God has called them to be, the able to look beyond the boundness of who they have manifested and say, you know what, there's something so precious. There's something so precious. So while we are doing this to maintain what God has given to us, we have to always reach back and say, God, there's a one because this one is just like I was that person. Somebody had to believe in me when I was messing up. Somebody had to extend grace to me when I was acting a fool and doing crazy things and irrational things. And when I thought that I knew everything and nobody could tell me. Everybody needs somebody that will wear their knees out for you. That will take hold of the horns of the altar and believe God to bring supernatural deliverance in your life. To sometimes pray God's protection over your life until you can snap back into your right mind. Everybody needs somebody. And so sometimes out of God's goodness and his grace to you, there's a grace that you have to extend to a toxic person. Because maybe God has given something that is a deposit in you that will help to detoxify them. Maybe the love and the grace unconditionally that you extend from your heart can be able to actually neutralize the acid of bitterness that is in their soul. And help them to become who they need to be in the economy of God. Well, all of my time is gone, but I'm not finished. We'll continue this next Thursday night. I pray you got something out of the word of the Lord. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.